Thomas Woodrow Wilson was an American politician and academic who served as the 28th President of the United States from 1913 to 1921. Born and raised in Virginia, Wilson earned a Ph.D. in political science, working as a professor and scholar at various institutions before being chosen as president of Princeton University, where he worked from 1902 to 1910. In the election of 1910, he was the gubernatorial candidate of New Jersey's Democratic Party, and was elected the 34th governor of New Jersey, serving from 1911 to 1913. Running for president in 1912, a split in the Republican Party allowed his plurality, just over 40 percent, to win him a large electoral college margin. As president, Wilson was a leading force in the progressive movement, bolstered by his Democratic Party's winning control of both the White House and Congress in 1912. In office Wilson reintroduced the spoken State of the Union, which had been out of use since 1801. Leading the Congress, now in Democratic hands, he oversaw the passage of progressive legislative policies and paralleled until the New Deal in 1933. Included among these were the Federal Reserve Act, Federal Trade Commission Act, the Clayton Antitrust Act, and the Federal Farm Loan Act. Having taken office one month after ratification of the 16th Amendment, Wilson called a special session of Congress, whose work culminated in the Revenue Act of 1913, reintroducing an income tax and lowering tariffs. Through passage of the Adamson Act, imposing an eight-hour workday for railroads, he averted a railroad strike and an ensuing economic crisis. Upon the outbreak of World War I in 1914, Wilson maintained a policy of neutrality, while pursuing a more aggressive policy in dealing with Mexico's civil war. Wilson faced former Governor Charles Evans Hughes of New York in the presidential elections of 1916. He became the first Democrat since Andrew Jackson elected to consecutive terms with a narrow majority. Wilson's second term was dominated by American entry into World War I. In April 1917, when Germany resumed unrestricted submarine warfare, Wilson asked Congress to declare war in order to make the world safe for democracy. The United States conducted military operations alongside the Allies although without a formal alliance. During the war, Wilson focused on diplomacy and financial considerations, leaving military strategy to the generals, especially General John J. Pershing, loaning billions of dollars to Britain, France, and other allies. The United States aided their finance of the war effort. Through the Selective Service Act, conscription sent 10,000 freshly trained soldiers to France per day by summer of 1918. On the home front, he raised income taxes, borrowing billions of dollars through the public's purchase of Liberty Bonds. He set up the War Industries Board, promoted labor union cooperation, regulating agriculture and food production through the Lever Act and granting to the Secretary of the Treasury, William McAdoo, direct control of the nation's railroad system. In his 1915 State of the Union, Wilson asked Congress for what became the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918, suppressing anti-draft activists. The crackdown was intensified by his Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer to include expulsion of non-citizen radicals during the first Red Scare of 1919-1920, following years of advocacy for suffrage on the state level. In 1918 he endorsed the 19th Amendment whose ratification provided all women the right to vote by its ratification in 1920. Over Southern opposition, Wilson staffed his government with Southern Democrats who believed in segregation. He gave department heads greater autonomy in their management. Early in 1918, he issued his Principles for Peace, the 14 Points, and in 1919, following armistice, he traveled to Paris 
promoting the formation of a League of Nations, concluding the Treaty of Versailles. Following his return from Europe, Wilson embarked on a nationwide tour in 1919 to campaign for the treaty, suffering a severe stroke. The treaty was met with serious concern by Senate Republicans, and Wilson rejected a compromise effort led by Henry Cabot Lodge, leading to the Senate's rejection of the treaty. Due to his stroke, Wilson secluded himself in the White House, disability having diminished his power and influence. A devoted Presbyterian, Wilson infused morality into his internationalism, an ideology now referred to as Wilsonian, an activist foreign policy calling on the nation to promote global democracy. For his sponsorship of the League of Nations, Wilson was awarded the 1990 Nobel Peace Prize, the second of three sitting presidents so honored. Early life Wilson was born in Staunton, Virginia, on December 28, 1856, at 18 to 24 North Calder Street, of Scots Irish descent. He was the third of four children of Joseph Ruggles Wilson and Jessie Janet Woodrow. Wilson's paternal grandparents immigrated to the United States from Strabane, County Tyrone, Ireland, in 1807. His mother was born in Carlisle, Cumberland, England, the daughter of Rev. Dr. Thomas Woodrow from Paisley, Scotland, and Marion Williamson from Glasgow. This was one of the border counties, which supplied many immigrants to the North American colonies in the late 18th century. Joseph originally lived in Steubenville, Ohio, where his family had settled. Wilson's grandfather had published a pro-tariff and anti-slavery newspaper, the Western Herald and Gazette. Wilson's parents moved south in 1851 and came to fully identify with it. His father defended slavery, owned slaves and set up a Sunday school for them. Both parents identified with the Confederacy, they cared for wounded soldiers at the church, and Wilson's father briefly served as a chaplain to the Confederate Army. Woodrow Wilson's earliest memory, from the age of three, was of hearing that Abraham Lincoln had been elected and that a war was coming. Wilson would forever recall standing for a moment at General Robert E. Lee's side and looking up into his face. Wilson's father was one of the founders of the Southern Presbyterian Church in the United States in 1861 after it split from the Northern Presbyterians. He served as the first permanent clerk of the Southern Church's General Assembly, was stated clerk from 1865 to 1898, and was moderator of the PCUS General Assembly in 1879. He became minister of the First Presbyterian Church in Augusta, Georgia, and the family lived there until young Wilson was 14. Wilson in 1873 formally became a member of the Columbia First Presbyterian Church and remained a member throughout his life. Education Wilson's reading began at age 10, possibly delayed by dyslexia. He later blamed the lack of schools in the postbellum South. As a teen, he taught himself the Graham shorthand system to compensate, and achieved academically with self-discipline, studying at home with his father, then in classes at a small Augusta school. During Reconstruction, Wilson lived in Columbia, South Carolina, from 1870 to 1874, while his father was professor at the Columbia Theological Seminary. His father moved the family to Wilmington, North Carolina, in 1874 where he was the minister at First Presbyterian Church until 1882. Wilson attended Davidson College in North Carolina for the 1873-74 school year, cut short by illness, then transferred to Princeton as a freshman when his father began teaching at the university. He graduated in 1879, a member of Phi Kappa Psi fraternity. In his second year, he studied political philosophy and history, was active in the Whig Literary and Debating Society, and wrote for the Nassau Literary Review. 
He organized the Liberal Debating Society and later coached the Whig Clio debate panel. In the hotly contested election of 1876, Wilson declared his support for the Democratic Party and its nominee, Samuel J. Tilden. In 1879, Wilson attended law school at the University of Virginia for one year. He was involved in the Virginia Glee Club and was president of the Jefferson Literary and Debating Society. While there, he enjoyed frequent trips to his birthplace of Staunton. He visited with cousins, and fell in love with one, Hattie Woodrow, though his affections were unrequited. His health became frail and dictated withdrawal, so he went home to his parents, then living in Wilmington, North Carolina, where he continued his law studies. Wilson was admitted to the Georgia Bar and made a brief attempt at law practice in January 1882. He found legal history and substantive jurisprudence interesting, but abhorred the day-to-day -day procedural aspects. After less than a year, he abandoned the practice to pursue his study of political science and history. Both parents expressed concern over a potentially premature decision. In the fall of April 1883, Wilson entered Johns Hopkins University to study history, political science and the German language. Three years later, he completed his doctoral dissertation, Congressional Government, a study in American politics, and received a Ph.D. marriage and family. In late spring of 1883, Wilson was summoned to Rome, Georgia, to assist in the settlement of his maternal uncle William's estate, which was being mishandled by a brother-in-law. While there he met and fell in love with Ellen Louise Axon, the daughter of a minister from Savannah, Georgia. He proposed to her and they became engaged in Asheville. Wilson's marriage to Ellen was delayed by traumatic developments in her family. In late 1883, Ellen's father Edward, suffering from depression, was admitted to the Georgia State Mental Hospital, where in 1884 he committed suicide. After graduation, she pursued portrait art and received a medal for one of her works from the Paris International Exposition. She happily agreed to sacrifice further independent artistic pursuits in order to keep her marriage commitment, and in 1885 she and Wilson married. Personal Interests Wilson was an automobile enthusiast, and took daily rides while he was president in his favorite car, a 1919 Pierce Arrow. His enjoyment of motoring made him an advocate of funding for public highways. Wilson was an avid baseball fan, and in 1915 became the first sitting president to attend and throw out the first ball at a World Series game. Wilson had been a center fielder during his Davidson College days and was the Princeton team's assistant manager. He cycled regularly, taking several cycling vacations in the English Lake District. Wilson later took up golf. Academic career Wilson worked as a lecturer at Cornell University in 1886-87, where he joined the Irving Literary Society. He next taught at Bryn Mawr College from 1885 until 1888, teaching ancient Greek and Roman history. While there, he refused offers from the universities of Michigan and Indiana. When Ellen was pregnant with their first child in 1886, the couple decided that Ellen should go to her Aunt Louisa Brown's residence in Gainesville, Georgia, to have their first child. She arrived just one day before the baby, Margaret, was born in April 1886. Their second child, Jesse, was born in August 1887. In 1888, Wilson left Bryn Mawr for Wesleyan University. It was a controversial move, as he had signed a three-year contract with Bryn Mawr in 1887. Both parties claimed contract violations and the matter subsided. At Wesleyan, he coached the football team and founded the debate team, which bears his name. In February 1890, with the help of friends, Wilson was elected by the Princeton University Board to the Chair of Jurisprudence and Political Economy, at an annual salary of $3,000. He continued a previous practice of reserving time for a six-week course in administration at Johns Hopkins. 
He was also a faculty member of the short-lived Coordinate College, Evelyn College for Women. Additionally, Wilson became the first lecturer of constitutional law at New York Law School, where he taught with Charles Evans Hughes, representing the American Whig Society. Wilson delivered an oration at Princeton's sesquicentennial celebration entitled Princeton in the Nation's Service, which was the origin for the school's motto. Wilson became annoyed that Princeton was not living up to its potential, complaining, there's a little college down in Kentucky which in 60 years has graduated more men who have acquired prominence and fame than has Princeton in her 150 years, political science author. U.S. Democratic Republic and British Parliament contrast Wilson, a disciple of Walter Bage Hot, considered the United States Constitution to be cumbersome and open to corruption. Wilson favored a parliamentary system for the United States and in the early 1880s wrote, I ask you to put this question to yourselves. Should we not draw the executive and legislature closer together? Should we not, on the one hand, Give the individual leaders of opinion in Congress a better chance to have an intimate party in determining who should be president, and the president, on the other hand, a better chance to approve himself a statesman, and his advisers capable men of affairs. In the guidance of Congress, Wilson's first political work, Congressional Government, advocated a parliamentary system. He critically described the United States government, with frequent negative comparisons to Westminster. Critics contended the book was written without the benefit of the author observing any operational aspect of the U.S. Congress, and supporters asserted the work was the product of the imagination of a future statesman. The book reflected the greater power of the legislature relative to the executive during the postbellum period. Wilson later became a regular contributor to Political Science Quarterly, an academic journal. Wilson's second publication in 1890 was a textbook, entitled The State, used widely in college courses throughout the country until the 1920s. He argued that government should not be deemed evil and advocated the use of government to allay social ills and advance society's welfare. In 1889 Wilson contributed to a U.S. historical series covering the period from Prez. Jackson through Reconstruction. His third book, entitled Division and Reunion, was published in 1893 and considered an outstanding contribution to American historical writing. Wilson's fourth publication, a five-volume work entitled History of the American People, was the culmination of a series of articles written for Harper's, and was published in 1902. In 1899, Wilson wrote in The State that governments could legitimately promote the general welfare by forbidding child labor, by supervising the sanitary conditions of factories, by limiting the employment of women in occupations hurtful to their health, by instituting official tests of the purity or the quality of goods sold, by limiting the hours of labor in certain trades and by 101 limitations of the power of unscrupulous or heartless men to outdo the scrupulous and merciful in trade or industry. Wilson believed that America's system of checks and balances complicated American governance. If government behaved badly, Wilson queried, how is the schoolmaster, the nation? To know which boy needs the whipping, Wilson singled out the United States House of Representatives for particular criticism, saying, divided up, as it were, into 47 seigneuries, in each of which a standing committee is the court baron and its chairman lord proprietor. These petty barons, some of them not a little powerful, but none of them within reach of the full powers of rule, may it will exercise an almost despotic sway within their own shires, and may sometimes threaten to convulse even the realm itself. In his last scholarly work, Constitutional Government of the United States, Wilson said that the presidency will be as big as and as influential as the man who occupies it by the time of his presidency. Wilson hoped that presidents could be party leaders in the same way British prime ministers were. Wilson also hoped that the parties could be reorganized along ideological, not geographic, lines. 
He wrote, eight words contain the sum of the present degradation of our political parties. No leaders, no principles, no principles, no parties. Wilson also wrote that charity efforts should be removed from the private domain and made the imperative legal duty of the whole a position which, according to Robert M. Saunders, seemed to indicate that Wilson was laying the groundwork for the modern welfare state. Public administration Wilson also studied public administration, which he called government in action. It is the executive, the operative, the most visible side of government, and is of course as old as government itself. He believed that the study of public administration could enable officials to increase governmental efficiency. He faulted political leaders who focused on philosophical issues and the nature of government and dismissed the critical issues of government administration as mere practical detail. He thought such attitudes represented the requirements of smaller countries and populations. By his day, he thought, it is getting to be harder to run a constitution than to frame one. He thought it time to straighten the paths of government to make its business less unbusiness-like, to strengthen and purify its organization, and it to crown its dutifulness. He summarized the growth of such foreign states as Prussia, France, and England, highlighting the events that led to advances in administration. By contrast, he thought the United States required greater compromise because of the diversity of public opinion and the difficulty of forming a majority opinion. Thus practical reform to the government was necessarily slow. Yet Wilson insisted that administration lies outside the proper sphere of politics and that general laws which direct these things to be done are is obviously outside of an above administration. He likened administration to a machine that functions independent of the changing mood of its leaders. Such a line of demarcation is intended to focus responsibility for actions taken on the people or persons in charge. As Wilson put it, public attention must be easily directed, in each case of good or bad administration, to just the man deserving of praise or blame. There is no danger in power, if only it be not irresponsible. If it be divided, dealt out in share to many, it is obscured, essentially. The items under the discretion of administration must be limited in scope as to not block, nullify, obfuscate, or modify the implementation of governmental decree made by the executive branch.